Um, hi, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Lonnie Kupo, and I'm a PhD student in Millar's lab. And today I'm happy to introduce Renaud Lajoie, who is a researcher at the UCSF Memory and Aging Center, where he studies Alzheimer's disease and associated dementias. He trained in France with Gail Chetelet and at the UC Berkeley with Bill um, Yagus before joining UCSF in 2016 to work with Gil Rabinovich. His research uses multimodal imaging, fluid biomarkers, and cognitive measures to study neurodegenerative processes in hetero heterogeneous groups of patients. In the last few years, he has actively collaborated with neuropathologists to test and validate in vivo biomarkers and better understand what they can and cannot measure in living patients. So please feel free to either chat questions or raise your hand. Um, and Reno has already um, graciously said that he'll have some opportune moments for us to ask questions. So thank you. Great, thanks so much for the, for the introduction. I'm really, um, really honored, really happy to be here. Uh, like Sylvia said, I, I, I've, I've come to Montreal and to the Douglas uh, a couple of times in the past and I, I was really looking forward to coming again but that will happen some, someday. Um, and so, um, like you said, Lenny, my, my background is originally really in, in neuroimaging. And I think this is the uh, title slide that I would have shown uh, maybe a year or two ago. And now I'm really excited because I, I've actually learned a lot uh, about neuropathology. So uh, what, what I'm really gonna show, um, uh, um, show you today is really a mix of studies combining uh, in vivo imaging and postmortem analysis of the brain and also for some other aspects of the talk, I'll be showing uh, kind of like the similar um, set of analysis uh, run in uh, with PET imaging and with uh, postmortem data. Uh, and I've learned a lot, and I think I've learned a lot about the complexity of uh, what it means to um, you know, uh, make a neuropathological diagnosis, how complicated it is. And I think as a, neuro, as a, a neuroimager uh, uh, originally, um, I kind of misunderstood what neuropathology was and how it worked and how, you know, as um, like in vivo biomarker people, we usually refer to uh, their neuropathological gold standard, but actually it's, it's a little complicated. So I think um, if, if anything, I, I hope that um, uh, you will, that this is what you will remember from the, this talk today. Um, I have nothing to disclose um, except for my excitement to talk to you uh, today. And I'll start by just uh, th thinking, uh, you know, I I'm going to show you a lot of data that comes from uh, our lab, the RAB lab at UCSF, but also a, a lot of other people. This is the latest lab picture we have. It's a little sad, uh, but this is how it is. And I, I'll, I really uh, worked a lot in the last year with um, the uh, Brain Bank at UCSF, especially Bill Sully and, and Leah Greenberg, Salvo Spina, and Catherine Peterson. You you'll see beautiful data from them. And then, of course, I cannot not thank the Jagus Lab at UC Berkeley, which is where I, I, I met uh, Sylvia and actually Jacob Vogel as well. Um, and, and this is also a reminder of how cool uh, lab pictures used to be uh, a while ago. Um, so I'll, I'll start my talk by just uh, giving a, a, a few reminders about Alzheimer's and dementia, um, just to, to keep everyone up to date. Then uh, we'll talk about, I'll show you a, a few studies looking at um, of the validation of amyloid and talpet against uh, neuropathology. Um, then we'll talk about the clinical heterogeneity of Alzheimer's disease, because this is something that I think I wasn't really familiar with before coming to um, UCSF. And then if I have a little time, I'll show you some uh, really uh, amazing pictures um, of, uh, of what the, the future might um, uh, be for uh, pet to pathology studies or, or really just imaging to autopsy uh, studies in the future. And this is all Leo Greenberg's lab. So um, if we go back to like 94, this is what, how Alzheimer's disease would be described. It's this clinic pathological entity. Um, it's people have like this progressive dementia with an insidious onset and usually memory predominant. And then at autopsy, uh, we see that they have amyloid and tau in their brain. We'll get back to the amyloid and tau part because it's, it's not a binary thing. Uh, and these are the, the clinical uh, diagnoses that have been used for a very long time that were uh, published in 84. And the, the, so at the time, the clinical, and for a very long time until very recently, the clinical diagnosis of, of Alzheimer's disease was probabilistic. Uh, the in vivo uh, diagnosis was only probabilistic. And it was kind of like by exclusion. And once you exclude other causes of Alzheimer's disease, 
uh, you, you can you can say it's probably Alzheimer's. And so the terms were really probable or possible Alzheimer's disease. And in this study, um, this study for me is is really uh, is really telling. It was conducting in the uh, in the U.S. in the in the uh, NIH um, Alzheimer's Disease Center. So really, um, dementia expert centers. Uh, we're not talking about like a, a, any uh, type of diagnosis. And even these experts uh, in in Alzheimer's disease and dementia, uh, when they confronted their uh, clinical diagnosis to the neuropathological diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, you can see that the performance of the clinical diagnosis was pretty poor. Uh, for probable Alzheimer's disease, you have a sensitivity of around 75%, but a specificity of 60% or 70, so pretty low. Um, and this is this is definitely not great. You don't want um, this. This is not what you, what you want for uh, a clinical estimation of of what's going on in the brain. Uh, so what's happening is that there are patients who, ha who are diagnosed with this uh, Alzheimer's dementia clinic presentation, uh, but they don't have Alzheimer's disease in the brain. They have either other neurodegenerative diseases, uh, cerebr cerebrovascular disease, or even psychiatric uh, conditions. And then on the other uh, end of the spectrum, we have cases who have uh, Alzheimer's pathology in their brain, but no clinical uh, criteria for the disease. So they are either normal-ish, or they're clinically impaired, but not with a syndrome that was diagnosed as consistent with Alzheimer's disease. So this is really, really an issue. And so this is what, what used to be the case until recently. And if we go back in time, I won't like uh, show you all, all the little, de uh, all, all, I won't detail everything, but over the last 13 years, there's been a ton of evolution. So I think there's two major uh, things that happen. What's at the bottom of the screen is just the evolution of uh, biomarkers and how biomarkers have evolved uh, and how they've been uh, developed and validated and considered to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. And then in, in the meantime, we've really understood a little better how the clinical presentation of the disease could be. And you know, I think most people are familiar with the concept of uh, mild cognitive impairment, MCI, and this is something that also happened in, the, in, uh, like, uh, in this time frame. So now we have this like, different pr proposal uh, to study Alzheimer's disease, and this is represented in the top right corner, where Alzheimer's disease is really uh, considered just as a pathological uh, process that can be detected at death, at autopsy, but also in vivo with biomarkers. And the big change is that the, the new, uh, this new idea is that the Alzheimer's disease can be uh, diagnosed uh, kind of uh, regardless of whether uh, there are clinical symptoms and whatever these clinical symptoms are. Uh, so we'll go back to that. Uh, I think this is a controversial idea, but this is kind of like showing what has changed over the time and also what biomarkers have done. Because um, just to, um, to emphasize that point, uh, in the 84 criteria, um, biomarkers were not really present, but they were mentioned to kind of rule out alternative causes of dementia. You could see that, like, you know, used MRI or CT to see if there was a stroke or some cardiovascular uh, event that could explain some uh, clinical uh, impairment, uh, but it was really only to rule out other, th other stuff. And now uh, biomarkers are like used to define Alzheimer's disease. So to rule in Alzheimer's disease, this is really a big switch. And it might feel a little natural for um, people who just joined the field now, but it's really been a, 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 a big um, uh, revolution in the field. And so the way biomarkers are considered now, uh, you can, you can uh, see them through like two orthogonal uh, perspective. So there's imaging biomarkers and uh, biofluid biomarkers. But because I'm a neuroimaging person, uh, I'm just going to ignore the the bottom panel, and I have to say I've I've been cheating on neuroimaging lately. I've I've done some blood and CSF work, uh, but I'm I'm going to pretend I haven't. Uh, and so we're left with um, imaging biomarkers, and we have uh, biomarkers are now uh, now classified at like amyloid, tau, and neurodegeneration as this umbrella term. Um, and the reason why there's like little brackets around the end is that in the new criteria. Um, these biomarkers are not used to really diagnose Alzheimer's disease. They're kind of used to support the staging of the disease or how severe the, the, the patient is in the, in, in, uh, the diseases uh, uh, in a patient. But what really defines Alzheimer's disease, just like in postmortem tissues, is amyloid and tau. And um, this is my last kind of slide for the context. Um, this is just a, a showing the number of publication um, over time. 
uh, for Amlod Pet, Tau Pet, and FDG Pet, which was really the 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 the, the first of all. It was uh, the first paper was in in, in 1980, um, and so you can see Amlod Pet is is was developed in the mid 2000s in 2004, uh, and Tau Pet is more recent. So it's it, we don't know as much uh, yet, but you can see this is really a very active field and is kind of hard to follow actually. So the reason why we're super excited about biomarkers is just to uh, improve the um, uh, diagnosis, but also to help screen patients into clinical trials. Uh, if we have a, 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 a potential drug candidate that uh, is supposed to target Alzheimer's pathology, um, we, we want to make sure that the pathology is present in the brain. Then we want to use uh, biomarkers to monitor disease and to see if you, know, if you have an anti-amyloid treatment, uh, you want to make sure that it does get rid of amyloid. So biomarkers are essential to understand what, like, what the trait, what the what the drug is doing, and then something that I'm really interested in is like just study the disease in vivo and study its progression in living patients, which we couldn't do uh, 20 years ago. But I think that the main pro the, the main thing uh, one has to wonder is like, actually, what are we measuring with these biomarkers? What can we see? What can't we see with uh, PET imaging? And so before going to this, I I'll just give you a little summary, a little um, uh, introduction to the neuro neuropathology of Alzheimer's disease and amyloid and tau, just to help you understand that not everything is so straightforward. Um, so if we have like amyloid pathology first, there's different types of amyloid uh, beta deposits in the brain. There are diffuse plaques, neuritic plaques, even deposits in, in blood vessels that's uh, called CAA. And I'm not showing all the complexity here. But uh, what's interesting is to understand what neuropathologists look at when they look at a brain and when they make a diagnosis. So um, they have two staging systems that they use um, uh, um, on, a, on a daily basis uh, for the diagnosis. The first one is called tal face, and it's looking at where amyloid deposits are in the brain, and it only looks at diffuse and neuritic plaques. And you can see there's like uh, five different stages. The first one is showing um, uh, some deposits in the cortex. And the last one is uh, um, deposits in the cerebellum. And so this is not quantitative. This is really just, do, do we find plaques in the cerebellum? Yes or no? If yes, it's uh, no matter how many plaques, it's a, it's a phase five. And then there's the CIRAT score that looks only in the cortex and only at neuritic plaques. And that looks, it's kind of like a semi-quantitative um, scale of, of uh, to, to measure the density. And so these two measures are kind of correlated. You can see here in, in, a, in, a, in a study from our group, it's correlated, but it's not exactly the same thing. You can have like a, a tell a three stage and have like no uh, neurotic plaques in the cortex or like actually very frequent. So you can see there's a, there's a lot of variability uh, in these two measures. And again, they, they measure different aspects of the pathology and, and they measure different uh, um, density versus distribution. Um, then if we go back to tau, uh, tau in Alzheimer's disease is a specific type of tau that uh, creates paired helical filaments. I'm not going into the details. And you can find here like a very advanced stage uh, of, uh, of tau pathology in the hippocampus. There's actually tau everywhere, like the tau here shows in brown. Uh, so the, there's like it's a really advanced uh, uh, case. There's tau everywhere. And so tau can be found in the soma of neurons uh, as neurofibrillary tangles. And there's also, also other uh, um, um, areas where you can find tau pathology. Uh, but the one thing is that there's this like, very uh, common Bragg staging that really um, um, looks at the uh, topography of um, neurofibrillary tangles. Again, uh, there's different types of tau and this Bragg staging only measures one of them. Um, and the last point I want to make about tau is that um, here I'm only talking about uh, tau in Alzheimer's disease, but there are um, many other uh, diseases that um, show abnormal tau pathology, usually in the frontotemporal lobe or degeneration spectrum. So not Alzheimer's disease, a different process in the absence of amyloid, and the tau in these diseases is a little different uh, bioclinically. Um, but the Bragg staging we're talking about here, it only applies to the Alzheimer's disease neurofibrillary tangles. And this is my last slide about the diagnosis. Uh, I, I, I talked to you about these three different types of scales, um, uh, two scales for amyloid, uh, one scale for tau tangles. And the way the neuropathological, this is, this is really, um, I'm not making any of, of this up. This is, this is how the, the um, diagnostic um, uh, algorithm works. You have all these scores, they're transformed into ABC scores that are from zero to three, 
and then this ABC scores are mixed together. I'm not showing you how it's how the sausage is made because it's a little uh, complicated, uh, and it's transformed into four levels of Alzheimer's disease neuropathological changes. So this is the output of all the uh, neuropathological assessment for Alzheimer's disease. And in the uh, uh, pathological criteria that were published in uh, 2012, uh, they said that high uh, and intermediate levels of uh, ADNC should be considered ex uh, adequate explanation for cognitive impairment of dementia. So usually when a patient uh, comes to autopsy and um, has um, intermediate or high uh, Alzheimer's uh, disease neuropathological changes, the neuropathologist consider that um, um, Alzheimer's uh, was really uh, clinically relevant for this patient and could explain their clinical sim symptoms. So uh, my, my take home message here, and this is really about what I've learned uh, recently is that neuropathology is complicated uh, and it's really helpful to talk to a real neuropathologist, not someone like me that's just um, telling you what they understood. Um, uh, want to emphasize that none of these measures are actually really quantitative. And so it's really good to remember when we're going to be looking at relationship between uh, biomarker data that are really continuous measures that are quantitative and these measures of, of brain pathology. And so it really questions what should we use as a gold standard to validate biomarkers. Uh, and so um, before, before I, I'm, I'm moving to um, uh, actual uh, imaging data, because this is an imaging series, uh, I just wanted to um, uh, know if there was any question about, about this part of the talk, um, just because it's, it's pretty important for the rest. And if not, I'm going to continue. So, um, Renaud, I have a question. Uh, to what extent yeah. has this been, so I mean, these are all post-mortem measures. Do you know the extent to which this, these have been related back to kind of um, anything about the individuals in, in when they were alive and to what extent kind of any dementia scores correlate uh, from? Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, so I think, uh, you know, like if anything, even before imaging, we knew that like uh, tau pathology was gonna be more uh, tightly correlated to um, clinical deficits than the amyloid um, uh, pathology. And there's like, even the, the first big BRAC papers um, really, showed that it was, uh, you know, everyone who came to autopsy with a BRAC stage of five or six, almost everyone was, um, had at least clinical, um, like uh, cognitive deficits uh, uh, prior to death. So we know that like at some point when the BRAC pathology is very advanced, when you have um, really tangles uh, in, in your cortex, uh, it's, it's, it's always associated with clinical impairment. The one thing again is that you know you can have uh, you can have a BRAC six uh, assignment um, because you have some tangles in the in the motor cortex, but there's going to be another patient with a BRAC six and that has like ten times more uh, pathology. So it's and it's really like BRAC pathology does not uh, BRAC staging doesn't tell you anything about how much. It just tells you that you know if there's like everywhere in the cortex, like if you can find it up to the motor cortex, it's very likely that there's going to be quite some pathology in the rest of the cortex, but it's really just a correlation and it's a proxy for how much, but it's, it's, there's definitely a lot of variability. And it, it really, it's really important for the, the studies I'm gonna show later. I actually uh, have a question too. Um, I was wondering if there is a possibility, you'd mentioned that there are individuals who have the pathology but don't have any symptoms. So is there also a possibility that there's actually like quite a few young people who might have the pathology but are just never tested because they're young? Yeah, well, that, you know, that's definitely a, one thing that neuroimaging has been very helpful with is that, you know, you can always, if you see pathology in a patient and and they're fine, you might think that, you know, they're, they're coping with it or it's not enough pathology for them to develop um, symptoms and you would want to follow up in time but of course with pathology you can you can't and with imaging we, we sh like I, I think there's strong evidence then uh, now that like any amount of pathology is associated with a little worse uh, outcome uh, in the long term but um, but it's it's also you know you, again you can have like a break for pathology because they found some a couple of tangles in your in your I don't know if you're a temporal lobe but you know, it, it might not be enough to cause anything. Uh, so there's really a discrepancy here. And so um, uh, now I'm going to show you a study that we conducted actually with Nagahan Ayakta, who was uh, Sylvia's uh, uh, research assistant in the Jagus lab um, eight years ago. Um, just FYI. Uh, 
uh, and now she's uh, almost uh, 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 done with her medical studies at, at Stanford. And when she was in the lab, we worked together on, on the study uh, combining amyloid PET um, in patients who had a neuropathological um, um, uh, assessment. So to kind of see what we could see or not with amyloid PET. And I, I just want to introduce this like centiloid framework, because if you work with amyloid PET, you might um, uh, hear about this. It's just, you know, there's different PET tracers uh, for amyloid. There's many ways to process the image, like virtually all the labs do it differently. And so um, some researchers came up with this framework to standardize how amyloid uh, imaging is processed and uh, quantified. And so instead of um, giving, uh, you know, SGVR values or whatever values you create in your lab, you express the values in centiloids. And so for people who use uh, uh, Celsius degrees, it's, 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 it's a delight. Uh, because it's rational, uh, unlike the other degrees, right? Um, and so um, the, the uh, quantification of PET is, is anchored at two points, a zero and a hundred. Zero is the average signal you would see in a group of people with no amyloid, and a hundred is uh, the average signal in patients with um, typical um, uh, dementia uh, with Alzheimer's disease. So uh, we gathered a sample of uh, 179 patients with, um, with pathology, and it was, some of them were clinically normal, MCI, some of them had clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or other diseases. And uh, they died uh, at an average of like three years uh, prior, uh, post uh, PET. Uh, this was data coming from us, from uh, Pittsburgh, from Australia and from the Mayo Clinic. And uh, um, the data were all processed and quantified this way. And you can see, so the zero and a hundred points, they're just anchor points, but they're not limiting um, um, the, the distribution, just, just again, like Celsius degrees. Um, and you can see there's a lot of people around zero, which is great. It means they have no um, amyloid PET signal. And then there's a wide distribution of, of, of values. And so going back to the, the, the scales that we mentioned, this is the tau phasing that's used for clinical uh, diag uh, pathological diagnosis of, uh, of AD. Um, 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 here, you, I'm sorry. Here you can see the distribution of all the centiloid values in this group uh, and, and the high variability. You can see that uh, values um, are um, increased with increasing, uh, amyloid PET values increase with increasing uh, tau phasing. Uh, but uh, you can see in the, in the beginning, it doesn't quite work. Uh, there's no difference, uh, no increased amyloid signal in the uh, tau phase one cases. But the good news is that uh, you can see here uh, the values of amyloid PET we observe in patients with no amyloid in their brain at autopsy are really restricted. So this is great for us because it means that the, the amyloid PET signal is really uh, specific. You never see elevated uh, signal in someone who doesn't have amyloid at death. But then the um, downside of it is that we might miss a little uh, sensitivity. And especially here at this early stages of, of, of the disease, we might not be able to capture it with amyloid PET. Uh, again, this comes with caveats because um, you know, it's possible theoretically that uh, these patients develop um, pathology between the time they were scanned and, and death. But, um, uh, but we even saw this pattern when we restricted to, um, the, the analysis to patients who died within a year of, of the scan. So it's probably just a lack of sensitivity in the beginning. Um, and, and yeah, and this pattern was really consistent across the, the three cent or four centers we looked at. So um, it's really robust. Uh, going back to this other measure, now we're not looking at amyloid pathology anymore, but just this composite measure of Alzheimer's pathology that's used for the clinical diagnosis, uh, the ADNC measure. Uh, when we do uh, try to compare the low and um, um, non group to the intermediate and high, again, which is what is used to um, uh, to uh, uh, make the pathological uh, criteria. The area under the curve is pretty, is pretty good. It's 0.89. And with a, a, a threshold of 24 centiloids, uh, we get sensitivity and specificity that's pretty, pretty nice. Um, I, I would say again that you know, the, the lack of specificity is mainly due to the cases um, uh, here um, that are ADS, ADNC low, but uh, have high PET signal. And this is really um, like, kind of like, a, this is not a real false positive because we know they have amyloid, they just don't have full-blown Alzheimer's pathology in their brain. Uh, and so this is like for the 24 threshold, but uh, in, in the paper, you could find a different threshold for all the different um, um, neuropathological standards you, you would want to, um, to look at. All right, um, so this was for amyloid. Now I'm gonna show you more, uh, more recent data. It was just published in Brain last week. 
about um, talpit and uh, talpit with this tracer called flotasipur um, and we're interested in, in detecting uh, and seeing how it, uh, how it uh, detected Alzheimer's tau and maybe all other types of tau in the brain. Uh, so um, again, talpa is more recent, so we don't have as much data. And so far, uh, 20 patients from our um, uh, center here um, have come to autopsy. Um, and um, David Soleimani, who ran the uh, analysis here, um, um, uh, uh, gathered data from these patients and uh, what's interesting is that the, the color coding here shows that eight patients had a neuropathological diagnosis of, of Alzheimer's disease. They had uh, a lot of amyloid, a lot of tau, actually they were all bright six. Um, then in light green, you have cases who had diseases in their brain that is not Alzheimer's disease, but the other uh, tauopathies that I mentioned. And so there were nine of them. And then there were three cases who um, had other uh, pathologies in their brain, not tau, not Alzheimer's disease at all, uh, they had um, other diseases with uh, TDP or first proteins. Uh, I won't go into the details, but we're like in this study, we're really interested in can we see um, can we distinguish Alzheimer's from other diseases, but also can we distinguish the frontotemporal dementias due to tau um, uh, versus the uh, frontotemporal dementias due to the other proteins? So I'm just going to show you a couple of um, um, uh, representative images here. Uh, this is a patient with Alzheimer's disease. You can see the, the actual PET image on the left, the SUVR image. And on the right, it's just a statistical map comparing the, the patient to um, uh, clinical, uh, clinically normal amyloid negative controls. And well, you don't really need the statistical map here because you can see there's a lot of signal. Uh, so, and this is what we saw in all the Alzheimer's cases. Um, then if we go to um, uh, the non-Alzheimer's tau cases, uh, you can see here that I had to reduce the uh, color scale because the signal was never that high. Uh, and in all, uh, all these cases, we did see some signal. And you can see that th this tracer is a little messy. There's a little of um, what we call off-target signal. Uh, but you can see on, on the right that uh, the, in all of these patients, the signal was beyond the noise that we would observe in, 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 a, in a negative scan. So we, we thought that we actually had this like very high level of signal that could be related to tau um, pathology in Alzheimer's disease, then this mild signal in, in non-AD tau. But unfortunately, we scanned this uh, last patient, like it was the last patient added to the case series with um, a non-tau uh, uh, pathology in their brain. They had TDP. It was actually a, a autosomal dominant mutation case. And uh, they presented with a, a frontotemporal dementia, behavioral variant. And you can see there's a lot of uh, tau um, PET signal in, in this case. And so uh, we, uh, the pathologists went back and they actually did the immuno, um, an immunohistochemistry in this frontal cortex here. Uh, looking for tau, and uh, if you can't see anything, it's not because of your screen. There, there was nothing uh, at all. So there was no tau. There's no tau on the uh, in this brain, or no abnormal tau, and and the the signal was was elevated. So we know that this um, mild level of uh, tau pit signal, at least with this tracer, is non-specific uh, to um, to any sort of tau. So uh, this low signal cannot really be trusted or interpreted. Uh, as, oh. um, what do you think yeah. it is? Do you have any clue on what do you think might be the cause of that? This is really confusing because, um, you know, and, and it goes back to like um, a lot of um, studies in semantic variant of primary progressive aphasia, which is an, a language disease um, that comes with TDP like 80% or 90% of the time. It's associated with TDP pathology, not tau. And in all the cases scanned in the world virtually like dozens, um, they all see this mild level of binding. The problem is that it doesn't bind to TDP. The tracer doesn't bind to TDP. And we know from like um, autoradiography studies, you know, when, when you have a slice of brain and you put the tracer on it and then you see if the tracer is stuck to it. Um, in all these studies, it, like the, the tracers don't bind to TDP. So we don't know what it is. And there's a big discrepancy between the in vivo observations and what, what the pathologists report. And so we don't know. It might not be to, um, to the pathology. It might be to something in the neurogenerative tissue that is um, 
that is catching the tracer because um, again, it's not a, a random pattern. It's really the, the pattern of tracer in this patient is really where the brain is doing is is suffering, where the brain is atrophied. So there's something it's in the degenerative tissue in and of itself that does by uh, that the tracer binds to. But and we don't know it. Degenerative tissue of these disease. So that's interesting. Kind of a related question. So, you know, we often see signal in the occipital lobe and then, you know, based on the BRAC stages, that's supposed to kind of come later on. And then, so do you think that that's real signal or do you think that, do you think it's tau or do you think it's something else? Yeah, I don't know. I, I think the occipital thing is kind of really, really interesting because, uh, or, like, you know, originally we all, uh, went into like the Talbot world, um, thinking that the occipital lobe would be preserved in, in most cases. But, uh, and, and, and I agree with you, it's not, and it's not tracer specific. It happens with all the Talbot tracers. But the problem is that I don't, maybe it's just that the pathological studies uh, in the past were mainly reporting about the primary visual cortex and not really where we see the, the signal. So I'd be curious to know, um, you know what's going on, and actually, maybe my the last few slides when I talk about the neuropath of the future might help. Yeah, you should, you should have your ask your friend there, like your super <laughs> network of pathologists that question. Exactly, uh, I should always have them, like you know, uh, some somewhere reachable. Um, so um, the, the other thing is that you know, like not everything is like binary, and so in, in these cases who didn't have um, uh, Alzheimer's tau, they, like, they had a primary uh, pathological diagnosis of PSP or whatever, but they still, um, for the uh, vast majority, had some degree of Alzheimer's tau, so some low BRAC staging. And so uh, we, um, like David, we analyzed the data just looking at um, not, not categorizing people as AD or non-AD, but using a BRAC stage as a continuous. And here he looked at the enterorhinal signal uh, in, in, in all these patients. Uh, in a young controls that didn't go to autopsy, just as a reference, and then uh, classifying patients based on how, um, you know, their BRAC stage uh, assigned at autopsy. And what was disappointing here is that uh, we couldn't see um, any elevation of the Talpit signal until the very um, elevated cases. So uh, the cases on the very right are all the Alzheimer's cases. But then in all these other cases, we're hoping to see a signal um, elevation because, you know, enterorhinal is supposed to be the first region to get um, uh, tau. And this is like the BRAC one, two uh, stages are about the enterorhinal, but we could not detect any increase in signal in, in these cases. That was a little disappointing. And that um, it was the same with a different region. I'm not gonna go um, into more details. But um, it, bottom line is that really for Talpet, um, um, high, very high elevated uh, Talbot signal was uh, really specifically seen in cases with advanced um, Alzheimer's pathology. Uh, and the mild to moderate signal uh, was seen in both non-AD tau and non-tau cases. So uh, it can be a, like a real positive sometimes, but it can also be a false positive. Um, and unfortunately, we we had no evidence that early AD pathology could be reliably detected with the tracer. But again, I, I don't think this is definite evidence. And I think you know all these cases had some brain disease in the, uh, uh, that might impact the way the tracer works. Uh, this is they all had symptoms, all had brain atrophy. So I'm not sure how reliable uh, it is. Like I don't want to make any strong conclusion about the um, um, absence of evidence for um, early detection. Um, just want to emphasize that our data is really similar to the data published by the Mayo Clinic. The, the axes are just um, upside down, like reversed, but you can see that the Talpit signal uh, is really only increased uh, in cases with uh, BRAC stages of five and six, uh, so advanced cases. And then there was a paper from AVID. Uh, they looked at the data a little differently, uh, just looking at um, a visual read for uh, a Talpit, and they showed that this uh, moderate AD or AD patterns mm -hmm were really uh, observed in cases who died and had uh, BRAC stages of five or six, really. Um, so uh, really consistent. And just, just so you know, this, uh, this study was, uh, was the argument for the FDA uh, to approve TAL. So this tracer is now approved for clinical use in the US um, to um, evaluate patients uh, for Alzheimer's disease. All right, so uh, this is the end of my pathological, um, 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 the pathological part of the talk. Just re remind you, for both amyloid and tau, actually, high signal is specific to Alzheimer's neuropathology. Um, we uh, might not be able to detect er the earliest stages of pathology, 
uh, and that the current uh, Talbot methods are really detecting Alzheimer's tau, not any tau. And so on, on that note, I think there are questions in the chat. Or, oh no, Jacob. Jacob is, drew is, attention to a couple of papers describing uh, pathology in the occipital lobe. So thanks, Jacob. Yeah. Um, okay, Dr. Thanks. was wondering, how do you know that in AD, the tracer isn't also reflecting some kind of neurodegeneration as you hypothesize is the case for non-tau dementias, rather than binding to tau itself? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Thank you. So two things. Um, the first one is that we have evidence, you know, that like on, 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 on brain sections, uh, postmortem, if you, uh, if you put the tracer, um, on the brain, on the slice of brain, and there's a lot of tau tingles on it. Uh, the tracer stuck, uh, sticks to it, and uh, if you uh, and you can do this displacement studies where you add a lot of um, cold compound, like uh, the non-radioactive uh, tracer, uh, in high concentration, and then it removes the radioactive tracers from the tangles. So it's uh, like a displaceable uh, 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 binding of the tracer to the target. We know it. We know it works on postmortem tissues. And then in vivo, it's just really striking that the, the signal, you know, I had to change the color scale when I went to from the AD to the non-AD cases because the signal in AD is really, really beyond what we see in anyone who just has a degenerative brain and, and no tau um, at autopsy. So I think, I think the evidence is very strong. I, I hope it addressed your point. <laughs> I have, a, I have a quick question, if that's okay, if there's nothing else, Lonnie. Go ahead. Um, so, uh, so this conclusion that you have here, um, you know, often PET is kind of one of the holy grails in a clinical trial, um, you know, and especially given the explosion of, say, anti-amyloid agents, for example, that have been coming up. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, what does this mean in terms of, like, if, if our floor isn't really the floor, what does this mean when you're trying to look at kind of changes in, in amyloid in the context of these types of trials based on, on these really important findings? Yeah, I, I, I do think that it goes back to the, well, I mean, this is real, like the points you raise are really uh, relevant. I think the, the, the issue is that, you know, you can be, I think the PET data really gives you a more a real quantitative measure of how much pathology is in the brain. And we might not be able to detect like, you know, BRAC, like cases with BRAC3 who have like a few tangles in the hippocampus, a few tangles in the antrinal, but is that really relevant? Uh, like, is that really, like, do we really expect these few tangles to, to do play a role, a clinical, uh, to have a, a, a clinical impact? I, I'm not completely sure. So I think that somehow maybe the, the low sensitivity of our tracers might be a good thing for, i mean especially in clinical patients i think if you're going into the preclinical studies and detecting the disease before it's clinical you might want to really detect as much as you can as little as you can really like have a very uh, good detection threshold but for the clinical groups we like I don't want to um, be able to detect like a few tangles in the patient because if the patient has full blown dementia, the, the, the five tangles in the medial temporal lobe are, are, not, are probably not going to explain much. So um, it, it's, it's kind of, it comes with pros and cons. But I, I think I have, like, I think we have evidence that if, you know, if the amyloid PET signal decreases by a lot um, with the treatment, it does decrease a lot of the, the density of plaques in the brain. So it's, it's, it's relevant somehow. There is also one follow-up from Sherry who asks, um, are the AD and non-AD tau groups matched for level of atrophy? Um, well, so they're, they're not um, intentionally matched, but um, I, I think we see, um, we see pretty strong atrophy in both groups. I, I don't think there's any uh, strong difference there, um, especially because the um, you know, FTLD um, spectrum comes with pretty intense atrophy, but our Alzheimer's patients are uh, young onset, and this is the, and I segue to the rest of this talk, um, the young onset usually comes with pretty uh, strong atrophy as well. So um, I think they're pretty matched. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going to try to go pretty quick on this because I'm sorry, I, 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 maybe I'm, I, I, plan, I, I plan for too much. But just to give you a little um, 
insight about the heterogeneity of the clinical expression of, of, uh, of um, Alzheimer's disease. And I think you can think about this heterogeneity as a really multidimensional um, um, uh, factor, and I'm only going to present a couple of them. The first one is the age of onset. And we know that age is, the, is a risk factor for the disease. You're more likely to develop the disease in, uh, at a later age. But there's also some patients who develop the disease early on, and this is what we're specialized in here at, at UCSF. Uh, and some patients develop the disease before 65, and they don't have a mutation. So there's often a confusion that early onset is autosomal dominant, you know, mutation triggered um, Alzheimer's, but it's not always the case. And in most cases, early onset is not um, uh, uh, due to a mutation. So there's this axis, and then there's another axis that's really important, is the uh, variations in the clinical syndrome. We know, you know, like the 84th uh, criteria really... Um, forced you to have um, evidence for um, impaired memory uh, to make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And this kind of like old, like old fashioned way of considering Alzheimer's as like a slowly progressive amnestic dementia in older people, we know it's not true, it's not specific nor sensitive. And actually the clinical criteria for Alzheimer's disease were updated in 2011 and memory is not, uh, is not mandatory uh, for clinical diagnosis of probable AD anymore. Instead, we know that sometimes uh, Alzheimer's can present with uh, deficits uh, with very specific syndrome, symptoms, syndromes, sorry, um, that are either um, language predominant, like logopenic variant PPA, or visual spatial predominant, like PCA, and there's also others like, um, like more disease executive variants or even uh, cortical basal syndrome, which is a rarer syndrome, uh, but in 30% of the cases, it's due to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and you can think of these two dimensions that are um, as orthogonal, uh, theoretically, Although, um, you know, there's typical late onset amnestic AD that's in this top right corner, and then early onset non-amnestic cases that um, we kind of specialize in here. Um, so there, there's variation uh, across these two axes. The third dimension that I want to mention is the APOE4. APOE4 is really interesting because it's the main generic risk factor for sporadic AD. Um, it's not an autosomal dominant mutation, but it's a really strong risk factor. And it's usually associated with an earlier age of onset, but also with a more amnestic uh, variant. So it kind of pulls the, the patients in this uh, top left corner here. Um, just want to say that the cases I'm mentioning are really extreme cases of, of this heterogeneity, but this variability is everywhere. Even in, in groups like ADNI, where you know, they're all diagnosed as amnestic, they're all uh, older onset, uh, and, and still there are subgroups and subtypes of patients here. Uh, we're just studying the extreme cases of atypicality. Uh, and the reason why we're really interested in this is that it's, it's an issue. Um, it's an issue for um, us as biomarker people to be able to track the disease progression. If not everyone has pathology or has clinical deficits the same way or does not progress the same way, uh, it's hard to measure uh, the disease progression and to track uh, to, um, the disease over time uh, with a one-size-fits-all kind of metric. So in a lot of uh, studies that I'm like quick studies, I'm, I'm hopefully going to have time to show. Uh, we looked at how these um, factors were associated with brain pathology. Um, um, just so you know, all the patients uh, I'm going to show you are at the clinical stage of Alzheimer's disease. There's no preclinical AD, and I'm showing two cohort. One has neuroimaging data, uh, and one has uh, autopsy data. Uh, they're non-overlapping, but all of them have. Um, you know, biomarker or autopsy proven Alzheimer's disease. So the heterogeneity I'm talking about here is not due to like including patients who don't actually have Alzheimer's in their brain. Um, and also, of course, the samples are not representative. Uh, they're enriched in young onset atypical presentation. But the problem is also in terms of demographic, um, the vast majority of our patients are white uh, and uh, very highly educated. So definitely a big issue. Uh, we don't really know much about early onset AD in, in other groups, and this is a shame. Um, this is just showing you the average pattern of amyloid deposition in, in, in three groups. So patients with amnestic AD on the left, uh, the posterior cortical, the, so the visual um, uh, predominant pattern in the middle, and the language uh, predominant uh, uh, syndrome on the right. I can see amyloid is really everywhere, and when, you, when we compare the groups, we didn't find any really strong um, uh, group differences in, in where the amyloid was in their brain. That was really different with talpit, and this is the talpit signal, talking about occipital um, uh, signal here in the PCA group, which makes sense because they have major visual spatial um, deficits. 
Um, but you can see really uh, talpit really uh, varies with clinical syndromes. Uh, uh, it's really, it's been shown before, but this is the largest uh, group so far. And of course, the language predominant cases have a lot of left predominant uh, temporal parietal uh, signal. What was really interesting is that this signal of um, this difference of tau binding across groups was really similar to what we see with structural MRI, and this is in VBM. Uh, these two patterns really look alike. And we just looked at whether um, the PET differences could account in, in, the, in the atrophy patterns um, um, between the groups. And here I'm just showing you data from the occipital lobe because it's really silent here. Um, if you're just looking at this first model, the clinical syndrome explains like 30% of the variance of the occipital lobe volume. But once you introduce the local tau and local amyloid, you can see that the, the, there's no, like the, the full um, syndrome differences are explained by just how, um, how much tau there is in, in the occipital lobe. So really it seems that like um, tau distribution and, and amount is driving how much um, 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 uh, atrophy um, happens and why it differs across clinical syndromes. Um, this is really interesting because it was really echoing a, a paper from the, the brain bank here at UCSF that quantified tau tangles in this real quantitative way this time. So this is not bright staging. This is really, um, this pathologist sampled six brain regions that are displayed here. And they looked at, they quantified how much uh, neurofibrillary tangles they could find. And what was really uh, nice here is that they could also see that um, in different clinical syndromes, they had uh, different uh, um, um, uh, patterns of tau distribution. And here, for example, in cortical basal syndrome that has more um, um, symptoms, you can see a lot of tau pathology here in the, in the motor cortex. So this is really a nicely echoing um, um, mirroring the, the uh, imaging and the, and the pathological data. The other thing is that the patient age I mentioned, um, we looked at um, how age uh, uh, at scan impacted how much pathology we found in the brain. And we couldn't find anything for amyloid, uh, but we found a really big uh, negative relationship with tau, with younger patients having more um, tau binding. And this is all controlling for uh, disease severity uh, measured with MMSC and CR somaphloxes. Um, we also show that this was not driven by the atypical syndrome. You can see here the same plot, but the, the data points are colored and, and um, uh, coded by um, the uh, clinical presentation. And you can see that across all clinical syndromes, we always see the same kind of uh, negative association with younger patients having um, more um, um, uh, pathology. And when we went to look at where in the brain the association was found, you can see in purple the regions where uh, younger patients had higher uh, tau uh, signal. And this is really mostly everywhere, but mainly in the frontal and parietal lobe. And the only region where that didn't really show any association was the temporal cortex. And this is really interesting again, because when we went back to the, uh, um, the brain bank data and looked at the quantification of tangles in the brain, you can see here for uh, the cortical areas like um, uh, medial frontal, the temporal parietal, um, um, like superior temporal and parietal areas, we do see uh, the same um, effect of uh, age uh, of onset and, um, and tau burden. And the correlation strength is actually pretty equivalent to what we see in, in imaging. But when we looked at the um, CA1 and subiculum subfields of the hippocampus, we did not find any association. So it's really similar to PET. Uh, older age is associated with less tau in the cortex, but not in the medial temporal lobe. Bruno, there's a mm -hmm. question for you. How do you deal with the partial volume effects? Yeah, so it's it's a good point. Um, the data I'm showing here is not. Um, well, actually, the data, most of the data I'm showing is not partial volume corrected. Um, but the data, for example, for the occipital lobe that I was showing across the variance, it was all uh, partial volume corrected to check. Usually the partial volume correction does not really um, um, constitute a problem uh, for our data. It's kind of counterintuitive, but what's, when you see individual images, it's really strong how, um, you know, in a patient with PCA, um, they have a, a very, very strong um, occipital um, um, atrophy. Uh, it, it's really obvious visually. And still, the talpit signal is super high in the occipital lobe. The fact that there's not a lot of brain tissue left does not prevent the tracer from giving us a lot of signal. So if anything, the partial volume correction is increasing this talpit signal in atrophied regions. Um, 
but it doesn't, it, in our hands, it's never changed any of the association we've seen. It's, it makes them a little stronger, um, but, um, but it's, it's, it was kind of surprising, to be honest. Okay. And um, the, the other thing that we were interested in is that we know that, you know, early onset AD is not exactly the same as late onset. And usually early onset diseases, just like in many other things in medicine, is associated with a, a more aggressive disease, uh, more severe, uh, more rapid decline, uh, um, uh, faster atrophy, uh, brain atrophy. And this is just showing you in our neuropath uh, data. So all patients, like 140 patients with um, Alzheimer's in their brain at pathology, this is their uh, MMSC decline over time. And you can see that with uh, linear mixed effect models, we could see that there was an interaction. Basically, um, like the age of onset was really impacting how fast they were declining. And if you model this, um, uh, you know, for, if you model a five-year decline uh, in MMSC, at age 58, uh, you, uh, the patient lose 20 points in MMSC, so like uh, really, really uh, uh, severe decline. And at age uh, 74, uh, they only lose oh, like kind of half of, of this. So we really see this uh, difference in decline, but we're interested in whether this could be explained by um, the uh, differential effect of tau in, 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 in early and late onset. And so we looked at this a little differently, um, looking at longitudinal brain imaging. And so we had uh, patients with uh, PET at, base, at their baseline, baseline visit and MRI at both baseline and follow up. And so we quantify how severe and, um, and aggressive the disease was uh, by just quantifying their brain atrophy. And here you can see the atrophy rate is a y-axis, so higher values uh, meaning greater atrophy rates, more severe disease. And we did see that younger patients had more severe atrophy rates uh, than older patients. And in a series of mediation analysis, we did see that this relationship between um, um, younger age and more severe atroph atrophy rates could be explained by uh, their higher baseline tau level. So really, um, the fact that these early onset patients have a lot of tau is probably very relevant uh, clinically. The other thing that we saw in the study, and it's here uh, presented here, is that the like in, in four representative patients, is that the amount on the um, regional distribution of tau at the beginning of the study was really predictive of where the brain was going to um, atrophy in the future. Um, and um, the, the left column uh, shows amyloid deposits that really doesn't correlate to anything. So again, what really seems to matter for the patient um, is, is how much tau they have and, and where it is. Um, the other thing that is really important is that you know, there's this, uh, so far I've been talking about whether patients have Alzheimer's or not, but what we know is that it's actually very rare to have only Alzheimer's disease in your brain, and that most cases uh, with Alzheimer's pathology also have other things, uh, and it's been shown for a long time. And so here um, in, in our brain bank data, we uh, quantified uh, different types of uh, brain pathologies, actually six different types of um, pathologies, so CAA, Lewy body, uh, TDP43, hippocampal sclerosis, AGD, and, and vascular injury. And we could see that in, in a group of patients who had a pathological diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, an increased, uh, an older age of onset was associated with more uh, numerous uh, coexistent uh, non-Alzheimer's pathologies, so more co-pathologies in older brains. What is important, though, is that it's not equivalent for everyone. This is just, a, like, this time I'm showing you data, again, from the brain bank, but it's... Um, instead of showing age of onset as a continuous variable, we just split them in early and late onset um, just for visualization purposes. And you can see that their little person on the bars show the number of patients with uh, no uh, uh, pathology. So you can see that for all these four um, types of uh, co-pathologies, we have an, an, increase, um, uh, an increased prevalence of these non-Alzheimer's uh, co-pathologies in older age. Um, but that was not the case for everything. And actually, when we quantify um, CAA or Lewy body, uh, we did not find this pattern. And actually, it tended to be the other way around, uh, where um, um, uh, younger patients having uh, more of these copathologies. So, um, you know, even though there are more copathologies in older age, it's also not mm -hmm. the same ones um, uh, on average. The last data I, I'm, I'm showing you is data about APOE4. Um, showing, uh, you know, again, that we know APOE4 is the main risk factor for Alzheimer's disease in sporadic cases. And in our clinical sample, a uh, neuroimaging sample, we, didn't, we only found a relationship between APOE and talpa in the medial temporal lobe. 
with the E4 carriers having more uh, signal in uh, the medial temporal lobe. And it was a very, very impressive um, focal effect. Uh, even with like a more lenient, um, 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 a more liberal threshold, we couldn't find anywhere else. And it's really nice because it, it echoed perfectly data coming from, 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 from your group, actually, from, from the uh, Rosenitzel lab, uh, showing in two different cohorts with two different tracers that E4 was associated with tau uh, PET signal, again, very focally in the medial temporal lobe. So to conclude, I just want to say that the clinical variability is associated with tau, not amyloid differences. Uh, we don't really know why. We don't know if the variability of tau is due to genetic uh, um, factors. There, there are some interesting uh, data um, showing that pre suggesting that suggesting brain architecture might lead to the atypical distribution of tau. And this comes from data looking at how, um, you know, in this atypical variants of Alzheimer's disease, like language or PCA, uh, visual spatial uh, um, 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 syndromes, um, these uh, patients have a higher uh, frequency, a higher prevalence of early um, life developmental differences. Uh, so dyslexia is a little higher in patients who later develop a logopenic variant PPA. So it might mean that there's something in their brain that make it a little more frail, uh, not to Alzheimer's disease, but to develop Alzheimer's disease in these regions when it develops. Uh, the other thing is that we show that both older age and APOE4, where you know they're the main risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, but they're not just risk factor. They also impact where the tau is, and both factors um, create like trigger a more amnesic predominant uh, form of Alzheimer's disease because this um, burden of tau in the medial temporal lobe uh, compared to the uh, the cortex is is higher, and this is important. And I think you know the the older age of onset uh, stories important. Uh, older patients have less tau, they have more copathologies. So maybe it's because if you have more harmful copathologies, you need less tau to be clinically um, um, impaired. Uh, there might be differences in the chemical properties of tau in early, early versus late onset AD. We, we, we don't know yet. But we also need to consider that, you know, the pathology is happening to two very different brains. Like the brain, uh, the normal brain, pre-morbid brain, is not the same at age 50 and age 80. So maybe it's just that the same pathology is happening to different brains and then there's an interaction between the pathology itself and the brain in which it develops and then this is really relevant to um understand you know like the, the underlying uh, the, the cause of a clinical symptoms um because we don't know in older patients they have not a ton of Alzheimer's pathology they have a lot of other stuff so um it's going to be hard to um, know how much an anti-amyloid drug uh, even if it works perfectly, it's going to be helpful for them because we know they have a lot of other things going on. Um, and on that note, I'm just going to um, skip through uh, the fancy th stuff I wanted to show you. I, I, I just wanted to, um, I'm, I'm just going to skip to this slide that shows that uh, Leah Greenberg and her lab, they've developed this um, really uh, amazing way to um, quantify a full brain tau pathology and not just tau, other stuff and to uh, register it to um, the MRI and eventually to the PET scan that we acquire to better understand what we see in, in vivo. And uh, the reason why I really want to show this is because Leah is looking for a postdoc. Uh, and this is, I can't think of any uh, better lab uh, for anyone who's uh, really good with imaging processing and who wants to help uh, with the field. So, and our lab is also looking for postdocs if anyone's interested. Thank you, sorry I went a little over time. No, thank you. That was very interesting already. And I, uh, I wish we could have seen those slides. <laughs> um, so maybe we could take a couple extra minutes for questions today, since uh, you had already said that you could uh, meet with some of the students as well yeah. uh, to kick it off. Uh, Frederic asked a question in the chat. While there are group differences between the different subtypes of AD in terms of tau pet, is there a lot of intersubject variability within a specific diagnosis? If yes, is there a specific diagnosis that presents more variability in the spatial distribution or amount of tau pet? Yeah, that, that's that's a really really uh, great question because um, you know I'm 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 talking about these specific abnormal like uh, not abnormal a, 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 atypical cases as extreme cases of uh, on this spectrum, but. Of course, there is a lot of heterogeneity within each of those. And I think, for example, one very uh, easy thing is, uh, so logopenic variant PPA, uh, you know, they're all left predominant because it's language or like it's very rare, it's the other way around. But for PCA, 
we have PCA is usually extremely asymmetric, at least in our data set. But in some patients, it's very left predominant. In some patients, it's very right predominant. So there is variability in, in that, in that like, very simple asymmetry uh, factor uh, first. And then, you know, I think it, because tau relates to clinical and cognitive symptoms so well, um, I think the heterogeneity in tau patterns that you're going to see at imaging really relates to how um, um, perfectly phenotyped the patients are going to be. If you select patients who have a very specific types of uh, visual-spatial impairments and who don't have these other types of impairment, I'm sure that you're going to reduce the variability of tau uh, in their scans uh, because you're really um, tailoring um, like a very specific type of, of patients. But um, you know, I think the problem is that Alzheimer's disease. Uh, you know, we have these cases that are like specific language or visual spatial, but then the kind of like default group, the amnestic AD, they're all kind of amnestic because so many things can lead to memory problems. Then they're very heterogeneous because the, the clinical phenotyping is not that precise. Thank you. Does anybody else have a question? If you'd like to say it or chat it, it's fine either way. I do, but if no one else has one, anyone? So, you know, what about the what about the risk of APOE four in kind of early onset? Like, you know, how strong is it? And then the yeah. Um, so, E four uh, um, early onset, like sporadic early onset, is sporadic, kind of weird. Yeah, yeah we, we don't really know what uh, triggers it. We know that like there's um, so early onset patients um, have more APOE four than you know uh, normal controls. Um, but they don't actually have more, especially like in our sample either, um, they don't have more APOE4, like a higher frequency of E4 than uh, older onset AD. Um, you know, it's enriched, it's increased, but it's not that high. And it doesn't explain um, why, um, you know, E4 is not the explanation why uh, these early onset, like very early onset cases develop the disease that early on. And I think there's um, really uh, amazing geneticist at UCSF, uh, Jen Yokoyama, who's working on polygenic risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. And from what she sees, you know, um, the other non-APOE genes that um, are associated with, um, a a with um, Alzheimer's disease, um, they're not the same in early and late onset AD. So basically APOE4 works for, like, regardless of age, it's just a, a really strong risk factor. But then everything else seems to be, um, if you calculate a polygenic risk factor based on the late onset AD literature, apparently it doesn't really work that well in early onset. Um, there's something else. So there, there's another set of low, um, you know, low effect um, genes um, that um, ex maybe explain why uh, patients develop early onset AD. And it's, is it it's really, kind of, I yeah, it's interesting, right? Is it more kind of family based or? You know, is it to a certain extent between the autosomal dominant? I know it's not that, but right, but the kind of late onset sporadic. Do you see it kind of somewhere there, even if closer to kind of sporadic late onset, or do you really see both the sporadic together in different type of risk? I know that, like, I, I asked Jen actually last week because I, I knew I was talking about this. Um, the um, like like early onset sporadic AD is heritable. There's definitely like, a, like, you know, if you have a parent that had the disease, you're more likely to have it yourself than someone who doesn't. But it's, it's not the same pattern that you see, you know, in the family tree with um, autosomal dominant AD where like, you know, there's, you can tell there's a gene somewhere that is being transmitted and that explains like, you know, 50% of the cases. Um, so I think it's not really known. Also, you know, studying early onset AD is, is pretty recent. So um, I, I'm not sure that we have a lot of data and we're trying to collect a lot of, uh, of uh, data, like large scale, because, uh, you know, like genetic uh, studies do take huge samples. Um, so we're working on this with like this lead study that's like an ADNI study for uh, early onset AD. We're trying to gather um, hundreds of, of, of patients. Thanks. Are there any other questions? If not, then maybe you can all join me in thanking Renaud for such an excellent talk. Um, and for the students who are staying on to chat with him more, um, you can just stay on this call and we'll, we'll do it here.